Hello, BEDM 307 students. My name is Peter Holden, and I will be your instructor for Canadian Business Law 2, which is an extension of the BEDM 107 Canadian Business Law course. Um, what we're going to do today is we are going to talk about the course outline, the grading profile, the lecture schedule, and how the course is going to be delivered in this new COVID-19 pandemic normal. Hopefully it's a temporary new normal and we'll be back to uh, classes in the spring term. Um, so uh, what I'll do is I'll turn to the uh, course outline um, which looks like this and is posted to eLearn. Um, the top portion is the same as you've seen numerous times before. We acknowledge the uh, uh, Native people's lands. We've got the vision statement, the business statement, and then we talk about the coaching hours. Okay, so the coaching hours, there is no way I'm going to be in my office in the fall um, as, as none of the instructors will be and have uh, students expected to come in and see us. So coaching hours will be done online by email. If it's necessary and <clears throat> you feel it's necessary to have a face-to-face, -face, we can do a Teams sort of thing. The required textbook for the course is um, Risky Business, written by a fantastic lawyer by the name of Peter Holden. Um, this uh, book was designed for the Bad M 107 course, and because the first large portion of Bad M 307 is the same, um, you can uh, use that textbook, and if you can... Uh, uh, find yours and hopefully you kept it then you won't have to buy it but it's not that expensive anyway um, the uh, besides the textbook um, there's also uh, usually a, a stack of lecture materials that looks like this uh, that I sell through the bookstore I don't make any money on it we just cover the cost of printing however because um, of uh, COVID-19 um, we could get it printed and we could force you to buy it, um, <clears throat> but I think uh, it'll be safest if I just take out the absolutely most necessary material and post it to eLearn. So there's one of the advantages of uh, uh, online courses. You don't have to buy that. Okay, back to the uh, course outline. Um, what I would like to do for a few moments is talk about my background. Uh, for two reasons. Uh, first is, I think that you, as uh, at, particularly at this point of your educational process, should begin to be critical about the person that's standing in front of you. Do they have the credentials and the qualifications to actually deliver the material? Um, whether they do or not is uh, another matter, but uh, you, you want to, uh, um, first of all, uh, make sure they feel comfortable with that. Secondly, I think... Um, you have to start uh, being uh, critical of their um, uh, agendas they might have or their biases. Um, now, my only agenda is to get you through this course and make sure that you have what I think is the necessary business law um, background to help you when you do get out into business. Biases? I don't think I have any biases. Um, uh, like race, religion, color, and creed, uh, sexual preference, all those things. I don't think I've got a problem with any of that. Um, and um, uh, But I do have biases. Everyone has biases. I am uh, not particularly fond of unions. Um, oh, yeah, well, you had to join a union to teach here. Uh, no, we didn't, um, or at least I didn't. Um, only two instructors, I think, have, have made it through their careers without uh, having to join the union. One was uh, Lloyd Michaels, a fantastic instructor who's now retired. Um, hopefully he'll come back and do some contract work. But um, he was here before, uh, well, right from the beginning, before there was a union. And so he was sort of grandfathered in and nobody asked him to join. <clears throat> Actually, I think they did, but he refused. Um, anyway, my case, and there's a sort of a legal twist to this, is, um, of course, I'm a practicing, or was a practicing lawyer when I started working, and the Law Society had this ridiculous rule that lawyers could not belong to unions. We were professionals, did I say. And so uh, we, uh, there was a bit of a snob thing there, I think, uh, that professionals, uh, you know, shouldn't be able to join unions, either white-collar or blue-collar unions. Um, when you sort of take a hard look at it, the law society uh, is like a union. You cannot practice unless you belong, 
and you have to be dues and you're always regulated by them. So it's, it's uh, tantamount to a union anyway. Um, but anyway, I, uh, I couldn't join a union because of that. Um, and yet um, I was asked to teach at the university because I was a practicing lawyer. And, um, and so <clears throat> what I did was when the form came around uh, and they said, uh, here, sign here and pay your dues, I said, uh, you cannot join, uh, we'll operate under the RAND formula. And um, uh, every year they send it to me until finally somebody called me up and they said, okay, what are you talking about? You have to join the union. What's this RAND formula thing? And I pointed out to them that the law in Canada is such that if there's somebody that cannot join a union, but the union is okay with them working there and the university is okay with me working here, then um, I can join under what's called the RAND formula. In 1954, 58, something like that, there was a fellow who, um, <clears throat> you can probably hear the helicopter in the background. I'm coming to you from the <laughs> Sunshine Coast and it's a beautiful day, so I've got the window open and helicopters go over. So my apologies for that background noise. Uh, but anyway, um, what happened was the business wanted this person because he had specialized skills that they needed. The union really wanted this person on board too. Um, and the person wanted to work there, but there was something about his background, whether it was a religious or cultural, that he could not join a union. Uh, and it was a union closed shop. So it went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, <clears throat> and um, what happened in the Supreme Court of Canada is Mr. Justice Rand wrote a decision that said, okay, um, he uh, does not have to join a union, but he has to pay the union dues, which is really what the union wants anyway, and he will be protected by the union, but he cannot get involved in any union activities. This became known as the RAND formula, and that's how I uh, be, uh, managed to work at the university. Um, that's not why I am a little negative towards uh, unions. Uh, the reason is we're on a uh, uh, operating in a global economy, and it's really hard for our manufacturing base to compete against international bases when they don't have the wage levels that we do and when they don't have the regulation that we do. So that's the only reason I have any sort of negativity towards uh, unions. Um, but I'm also uh, negative towards uh, partnerships, um, and uh, I'll discuss that more when we get there. So you get you know, the, those sort of biases, and if I tell you about my background, then... Uh, then you'll have some hints or understanding towards that. Okay, um, I'm going to look at my education, my work experience, and my teaching experience. Education, oh, and by the way, there's a few of you that have had me before, so if you want to fast forward the video, please feel free. There's one student that's had me at least twice before, and, uh, and so you'll be snoozing uh, really quickly. Um, uh, my educational background, I got a, a BA in Canadian uh, History and Political Science from the University of British Columbia. And uh, that's a, it was a good education, but it didn't lead anywhere. Um, oh, I guess I could have taught if I wanted to, but I didn't want to teach. And I could work for the government, um, but I didn't want to do that either. Uh, I wound up teaching and I did have a job with the government. So there, there you go, that's life, right? But, but I didn't want to do those things. I always wanted to become a lawyer, but I, um, uh, I wanted to get a business education as well with my law degree because that's the area that I've, of law that I wanted to practice in. So I thought, okay, I'll go and uh, get my MBA, which I did from the University of British Columbia, an MBA in finance, and so you got to worry about them, right? <laughs> because I can't even balance my checkbook. <clears throat> Just kidding. Anyway, I got a, a MBA uh, in finance and uh, it's true that they recruit you and you have a job even before you finish the program. So I, I was uh, recruited and uh, hired by the Industrial Development Bank of Canada, which became the Federal Business Development Bank of Canada, which became the Business Devel or the yeah, Business Development Bank of Canada. They change their name every once in a while so that they uh, have something interesting to do because it's a pretty stifling place to work. But anyway, um, I, I finished uh, my MBA uh, reluctantly, having to do my final thesis, knowing I already had a job, so like, what was the point? Uh, but I got through it, and I started the job, and it was a great job in the sense that, um, uh, despite being a stifling conservative organization, and I did not fit that corporate culture, uh, it did cement, cement the uh, education that, that I just received, because 
Um, I now was looking at business plans, analyzing financial statements, actually drafting some business plans to help businesses get loans from the government when they could not get loans through the conventional lenders. The reason it was a conservative organization is because it was loans and you were like a loans officer in a bank, um, the um, FBDB, the Federal Business Development Bank, um, was hiring bankers left, right and center. Um, and so you had all these conservative bankers coming to work for an organization that was supposed to give riskier loans. It doesn't work. Anyway, um, I, I could not stay there too long. So I figured two years would be perfect because then um, uh, I could show I could hold a job and yet I wouldn't be tainted, hopefully, with the conservative banker characteristic. Um, nobody could believe I was going to quit. All the other credit officers said, hey, you've got a nice cushy job here. It's not hard, nine to five. You don't worry about it when you go home. Uh, and you got a fat pension at the end of the rainbow. Not for me. I quit at uh, the two-year mark. And I took a job in, on spec at the uh, National Research Center in uh, House of Commons in Ottawa, where I wrote uh, memos and business uh, uh, reports for members of parliament. Um, wasn't there very long before I fortunately joined uh, the staff of the Honorable Len Marchand, who was just appointed to a new portfolio called the Ministry of State for Small Business, right up my alley. That's what I wanted to do. So anyway, um, I joined his staff as the business assistant, and that, that's the best job in the whole world. I mean, if you ever get to do that, do it. It's um, uh, it's really interesting. Um, I traveled uh, in a jet star, uh, you know, that's a private jet, you know, with a steward running around saying, uh, can I refresh your drink, Mr. Holden? Would you like the New York Times or the Financial Post, Mr. Holden? Stayed at the best hotels, rode around in limousines, carried the minister's briefcases, um, and uh, all at your expense, by the way, uh, taxpayers' expense. Um, I don't begrudge members of parliament and senators in Canada anyway, for their expense accounts, unless they overdo it, which every once in a while somebody does. But that is a really difficult job. Um, they work incredibly long and incredibly hard. Um, and that's during the day. And then in the evenings, they, in order to get reelected or to help the party, they're expected to go out to functions and uh, uh, political gatherings and make speeches. Um, and they, they're in Ottawa, and they're separated from their families um, unless they take them to Ottawa, which can be costly, and um, uh, the divorce rate is high. Uh, I just, uh, I admire how hard they work. I'm not certain that a lot of it is productive, mind you, <laughs> but that's only my opinion. But I do, um, I, I do not begrudge them their expense accounts. It's tough enough. Anyway. Uh, anyway, that was the best job, um, as as well as all those perks. Um, I was I got to top secret clearance. Any document that went to cabinet, I got to see first. Um, well, first after the prime minister, I suppose. But anyway, first, um, <clears throat> so that I could uh, draft memos to my uh, uh, boss, the minister of state for small business, giving him some advice about what you know things he should raise. Uh, it's pretty heady, heady stuff, considering the um, the little bit of life experience I'd actually had. But it was uh, really neat. I had top secret clearance. They had to, the RCMP did a background check on me, and they even went and talked to my parents, which of course you know frightened the heck out of them because there's the RCMP standing at my door asking questions about their son, and all they could think of is, oh my God, what did he do? <laughs> uh, anyway, that was a really nice job. I worked for for Len Marchand, who is the native. Uh, 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 senator, a first native senator, I believe, and, uh, and probably the first native cabinet minister, although I'm not sure about that, but um, really nice man to work for. I worked for him for a year, and then there was a cabinet shuffle, and I went to the Minister of National Revenue's office, um, Senator Joe Gay from Manitoba, and um, uh, it was really interesting working for him. I think it's sort of tantamount to like working for President Trump. He, goes, he would go into tirades and fire people. Um, and uh, everybody lived in fear in the office. Uh, <clears throat> although I did figure out how to, um, uh, to get along with him. 
um, at the end of the day, he was a very lonely man. His wife had passed away and his, his family was gone and, and he was in Ottawa pretty much by himself. And so at the end of the day, he, was, he would be in his office and he'd be having a drink watching uh, the news on TV. Um, I would uh, leave the office uh, building that I was working in. I'd go over to the House of Commons and I'd go to his office and he'd say, oh, Peter, you know, have a drink. And we'd sit around, have a drink and chat and watch the news. And because he knew me socially, um, I didn't get fired. Um, two other fellows did that, uh, uh, one was the, um, uh, legislative assistant. So Joe Gay phoned me up and said, you do that. And the other was his uh, political assistant. So he phoned me up and he said, you do that. Uh, sorry, media assistant. And so I wound up, I wound up having three jobs at, you know, but, but I didn't get any more money. Uh, but at least I survived the year until there was a cabinet shuffle. And then I went back to the Ministry of State for Small Business and was working for the Honorable Tony Abbott from uh, Mississauga, um, <clears throat> doing seminars all across the country um, uh, and uh, traveling and, and doing logistics. And uh, they, they call you an advanced man because you'd go out and set all this up so that the minister would come and everything would go smoothly. I really enjoyed doing that job. Trouble is, it's a political job. So I went from being a civil servant to a political hack. Um, there was an election coming up and um, I ran the numbers as everybody was doing and I could see that the government was going to fall and I went in and told that to uh, Tony Abbott and said, uh, and you're going to lose your seat in Mississauga. And he said, yeah, he knew and he already had his next job lined up. What about me? And so I said, oh, well, I was hoping to go to law school. And so he said, well, um, do you need a letter of reference? And I said, that would be great. And he said, all right, you write it and I'll sign it. Ha <laughs> ha. Wow. Um, that was going to be a glowing letter of reference. Um, but I found it a really difficult letter to write because I wanted to make it sound like I'd walk, I could walk on water. And yet, um, uh, I knew he read it, uh, read his mail before he signed it. And so I, you know, it was kind of awkward to have a letter like that, but I, I managed, he signed it. I got a letter from uh, Joe Gay and I got a letter from Lynn Marchand and, um, I applied to law schools. Um, so after working five years, I was going to go to law school. I applied to six, got accepted at three, uh, UBC, uh, University of Ottawa, and Dalhousie. Uh, covered the country, West Coast, East Coast, Central Canada. So um, I had to decide which one to go to. And I, went, I was talking to the fellow at UBC, and he said, oh, go somewhere else. And I went, oh, okay, thank you. That's a real welcome. Um, he said, no, no, I'm in if I want to. But I had two degrees from UBC and maybe a degree from somewhere else would make me look uh, more well-rounded. So Dalhousie was the uh, what looked like the obvious choice because it's a very prestigious um, law school. But my wife, who had been working, wanted to go to uh, theater school and got accepted to a number of them. But w one of them was the National Theater School of Canada, very prestigious. At that point, they only took three males and three females a year. Pretty hard to get in there, eh? That was in Montreal. <clears throat> I had applied to Montreal, but they turned me down, probably because at the bottom of the application form where it said, will you take courses in French? I put no, uh, because I want to pass. <clears throat> and uh, so I, I think that was probably the wrong thing to put there. Anyway, I went, I decided to go to the University of Ottawa. Uh, the decision was basically made for me um, because it was the closest I could get to uh, Montreal. I don't think it made a difference in my career. I enjoyed law school. I was used to a nine to five work day. And so I would work from nine to five at the university and um, had my evening, evenings free, um, weekends free. I even remember one time at, uh, you know, I'd go, I'd go to sleep at 10, 10.30 at night. And remember one time before an exam, I was asleep at two o'clock in the morning, another student called and woke me up and he was having all sorts of problems and he had questions he wanted me to help him with. And he said, uh, were you sleeping? And I went, yeah, it's like two in the morning. And he said, yeah, and he's, and he did an all nighter and he actually took pills and he came in to write his exam. Uh, I didn't have to, and I think it made it a lot more enjoyable. Um, I, <clears throat> in second year, I started working as assistants to Crown Council and won my first trial. Um, and uh, I, uh, I was the uh, 
captain of the men's hockey team. I was the men's sports rep on the student council. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I was just checking to make sure I was still recording. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, I was even chosen to be on the, the moot court team, but I wasn't going to get to argue, so I, I, said, I didn't want to do that. <clears throat> Anyway, I had, a, I had a really good time. I wrote my last exam on a Friday in mid-May, and Saturday I was on a plane back to Vancouver. I don't know if any of you are from Ottawa, but uh, three years working there and then uh, three years at law school, I had had enough of their winters. Uh, their um, summers, are, unless you have air conditioning, are hot and muggy too. And, uh, you know, the only decent uh, season is the fall. So anyway, um, I was eager to get back to Vancouver. I came back to Vancouver and I articled with a medium-sized uh, law firm, uh, Ray Connell Lightbody and Reynolds, and I had a, a really, really good uh, set of articles. Um, I got to uh, do the practical side of law. At university, they teach you how to argue a case before the Supreme Court. And at articles, they tell you how to find the Supreme Court house so that you can ar argue there. Um, almost that practical. I mean, we did have to go to the courthouses to learn how to file documents and do um, interlocutory applications of a non-adversarial uh, 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 type. And you go to the land title office and you learn how to file documents to help people buy property and things like that. Passed my bar ads, didn't fail any, thank goodness. Um, got called to the bar in 1983. And the law firm wanted to keep me on and they wanted me to do collections that's when you go out and sue people to get money for your clients uh, when they're owed money and uh, i didn't want to do that and they wanted me to do maritime law and for years and years and years when you're doing maritime law it's looking at bills of lading and trying to figure out where the damage occurred during a trip and i thought no i don't want to do that they were going to have a position in the corporate commercial department, and that was exactly what I wanted to do, keeping with my business and my law and, and working for the Minister of State for Small Business. So I thought, that's you know great. And so I held out for it. Uh, there was a real downturn in the economy, a, um, a recession, and uh, they decided not to expand, and the other positions were gone, and I was unemployed. So I... Um, uh, it took a long time to find a job, uh, but I did with um, a sole practitioner, um, and I joined his his law office uh, and worked there for only a short period of time before he had the unmitigated gall to have a heart attack and wind up in the hospital, and then I wound up running his law practice and doing my law work and his law work um, without the guidance of another lawyer there, and that was probably one of the most stressful periods of my life. He returned and wanted to sell his firm, um, and I didn't want to buy it, so I moved to another firm. I did not like it there, but I have always had a very fortunate life, and you'll always see me saying, oh, you know, I had a fortunate life and knocking on wood, um, and uh, you knock on wood because in ye old England, uh, uh, there was a superstition that if you ever said something nice about your children or something, uh, or you'll have good crops in the fall, the sprites that lived in the woods would uh, do something nasty to you, you know, bring on the, the, the locust and ruin your crop or, you know, have a pox on your kids or something. And so they used to, whenever you said nice thing, you'd knock on wood because they lived in trees. And if you were knocking on wood, they couldn't hear you. <laughs> so I don't suspect there's very much to it, but it doesn't seem like it takes much to knock on wood. So just in case there's something to it, I do it. <laughs> Anyway, um, I, um, I got uh, hired by a three-man law firm in downtown Vancouver, and I'm not being sexist. It was three men. Um, I, one of them, senior partner, did uh, marketing and advertising, and he was probably the best lawyer west of Toronto uh, at that. And the other, one of the other lawyers did intellectual property, and he was probably the best IP lawyer west of Toronto. And uh, the other fellow did uh, franchises, but not uh, setting them up, um, getting people out of franchises. Uh, so anyway, um, I joined as the grunt. Whenever one of the clients needed a company incorporated, I would do it, or a contract drafted, I would do it, or some research, I would do it. Um, 
and I learned marketing and advertising law and I learned intellectual property law so it was really again you know just a just a, 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 a good fortunate job to get. Um, I was there for a number of years and then I became a partner with that firm and then I learned that it was probably the worst managed law firm on the face of the planet Earth uh, which probably means in the universe because if there's intelligent life out there the last thing they're going to have is a legal system. <laughs> <laughs> it drives people crazy. Just kidding. Anyway, um, I, uh, uh, I, w I was there and there was a lot of friction, not because I didn't like them or they liked me, but because of the operation of the, um, the office. Um, the partnership exploded. Um, they were both really sort of... Um, the, the lawyers that like the, the fancy cars and the, you know, and the going to these receptions and and putting on airs and large offices and things. And, um, so they both wanted to be partners, but with bigger firms. And so um, um, Bob McKay, the uh, one partner, went with uh, Russell and Dumoulin and, and Lance Turlock. The other partner went to uh, Swinton & Company and, uh, <clears throat> and the partnership exploded one day. And I was left sort of going like, what am I gonna do? Uh, which wasn't very nice of them, but uh, as it turns out, neither of them got to be partners, and uh, better still, um, because they had uh, such a battle with the lawyer that left over the lease, it was never finalized, and I never had to sign it, so they got stuck with the lease uh, on the premises. Um, anyway, that left me in a position where I um, had to go out and start a law firm by myself or scramble to join another law firm, uh, which is pretty tough to do in those days. And uh, it looked, it, we, and I, we had mortgages and stuff. And I shouldn't say mortgages, a mortgage. Um, and so uh, things looked bleak for like three days. And I've, like I said, I've always lived a very fortunate life. Um, Kaplan University called me up. It was Capilano College then, and they asked me if I was interested in teaching a full-time teaching load there. Uh, oh yeah, I am. Uh, that would certainly help with the mortgage and, and, and everything. Um, but I want to step back a little bit and say how I got there. Um, a few years earlier, before I became a partner with that firm, um, Capilano College called Bob Mackay, who had done, done some teaching in the evening for them, and um, uh, asked him if he would do some more teaching. And he said, oh, no, I'm a partner. I'm far too important. But I do have this lowly grunt in our office that might be interested. When I say I'm a very fortunate person, um, I really am. Because when I was in Un University of British Columbia taking my undergrad degree, I took the Bad M 107 law course. They call it, I can't remember, but something... 403 or something, 443. Um, but anyway, I took the course at UBC and it was one of the things that really cemented the fact that I wanted to be a lawyer. I really liked the course. I really liked the instructor. His name was Peter Watts and he was just dynamic and funny and intelligent and, and uh, well-spoken. Um, I, I got an A in the course and I took Law 2 with him and I got an A in the course and I... Um, uh, became a marker for him while I was in the MBA program. And he became my mentor when I was going through uh, law school and starting my practice. Uh, and uh, so anyway, um, uh, the, that was the, the course. And um, I, I found out that the course outline was exactly the same as UBC's and the textbook was the same. And so it was like a dream come true. So I, I did that a couple of evenings, uh, in a, a couple of terms in the evening, and um, but then I didn't do it when I became a partner. And here's here's the first, or I guess the second irritating thing about a partnership. Um, I had become a partner, and the Catholic college asked me if I'd do it again, and I s said I have to check with my partners, and they were so excited. Oh yes, yes, do it, Peter. Yes, you'll be up there using the partnership name, talking to business people who will then become you know, pardon me, uh, clients with our uh, firm. And, and, then, and then there's the money. And I said, well, they don't pay you too much. And they said, no, no, but you know, it's still great because it comes into the firm and it gets divided up. And I went, what? And they went, well, yeah, the, um, uh, the income from teaching comes into the partnership and gets divided between the three of us. Because 
when you're a partner, anything, any income you generate while you're a partner, um, it gets paid into the firm, even if you do it after hours, because really you're a partner 24 seven. Okay. And I thought, they don't pay you a lot anyway. I wasn't going to do it for one third of that sum. And so I turned Capilano College down. Um, <clears throat> but then uh, they called me up when there was a full-time teaching load and asked me again. And, and so I went out and I had an interview with Greg Lee, who was the dean of business then. He became the president of the university and retired not too long ago. Um, I was going through the job interview with him and um, he said at one point, um, I I feel some reluctance on your part here, Peter. And I said, well, yeah, I mean, I really, really like teaching and I really want to teach the courses, but I don't want to give up my law practice too. And he said, oh, well, why do you want to stop practicing law? And I thought, oh, there's one of those trick questions you get during a job interview. We want to hire you full time. Are you going to have a job on the side? Because most bosses or businesses don't like that, right? Um, and I didn't know how to answer it. And so finally I thought, and honesty is the best policy. And I said, look, Greg, I don't understand. You're, you're hiring me full time and you want me to have um, a law practice on the side? And he said, uh, Peter, um, you don't get to teach her unless you also have your law practice on the side. And the reason is nobody teaches in the school of business or are supposed to teach in the school of business without actually going out and doing real work in the real world so that we can bring that real world knowledge to that class. And that's really important for you. Um, okay, so anyway, I um, uh, I got hired by Kaplan University and I had the best of both worlds. Um, I associated myself with a downtown law firm just for, um, uh, you know, the part-time practice, uh, basically a, a desk and a phone and I paid for secretarial service. And um, I was teaching at Kaplan University, and I got some teaching in the MBA faculty at UBC. Pardon me. Um, and the interesting thing was that I, you know, although I was married, um, at this time when I was very busy, I was having an intimate love affair. Not with another woman, with my car. Okay, I'd get up in the morning, I'd get in my car, I'd drive to Kaplan College. I'd teach, I'd get in my car, I'd drive downtown to my law firm in my car. I'd finish law work, I would go to UBC in my car and I would teach and then I would drive home in my car. And um, uh, I was getting burned out very quickly. The teaching at UBC came to an end because it was just because someone was on a sabbatical for a year. Um, and at the same time, my wife, who had become a, uh, a professional actress uh, and was doing okay, didn't like it. Okay. And so she stopped and she took a, a business job and she was very successful, burned herself out, took some time off, wanted to get back into, um, uh, into uh, business and uh, into work. And she said, why don't you bring your law practice home, Peter? And I went, oh. she said, what? And I said, um, if I don't wear a three-piece pinstripe suit, have a Gucci briefcase and a downtown office, nobody's going to take me seriously as a lawyer. Um, and she said, oh, well, you know, why don't you check with your clients? And I thought, mm, okay, I just suppose I should. I mean, after all, I do marketing and advertising as one of my specialties, and maybe I should do some marketing. So I contacted my uh, clients, and uh, I found out that, that business was changing, the law business anyway, um, and um, in a way that nobody was really thinking about. Um, my clients told me they didn't care where I was as long as they could get to me on the phone. Uh, and that included the surface of Mars. Okay, I could be that far away as long as they could reach me. So I moved my law practice home and had a rule that I did the banking. So I had contact with the bankers and, uh, uh, and contact with the accountants. And um, um, when the phone rang, I answered it almost always. Uh, except when I was off teaching. And um, so <clears throat> um, I still was somewhat reluctant about the fact that my my um, office was at home. Someone would say, Peter, where's your office? And I'd go, at home. And they'd say, uh, sorry, what? At home. Um, but I found, I was contacted uh, by a lawyer one time. And he, well, this is Jeremy Melbourne III. Can I please speak to Peter Holden? And I thought, whoa, what file is this on? And man, this guy sounds angry. Uh, and I said, speaking, and he said, um, are you the guy that works out of your home? And I went, yes. 
And he said, uh, what's it like? And I went, pardon? And it turned out he was calling to find out what it was like working out at home because he heard I did it. Um, and uh, he was stuck in the middle of the Lionsgate Bridge uh, for an hour and a half trying to get into the office. And so he said that happens too often. Um, he just wants to move his uh, practice home. A short while later, I was contacted by an, an accountant. Uh, we had a mutual client, and he found out I was working in my home, and he asked me about it. And I said, uh, "It was there's really good parts, and then there's a few drawbacks. Um, and he eventually moved his practice home as well. Um, the advantages uh, is the commute. I mean, you get up in the morning, you walk down your stairs to the coffee machine, walk into the office and sit down. <clears throat> um, and, and I'll tell you one anecdote uh, that, um, uh, that sort of describes the best part of it. I had a client in Australia negotiating a contract. And we were dealing with each other on the phone and by fax. And the last time he was talking to me, he said, Peter, um, uh, I'm going to need you on the phone tomorrow uh, when I get the final contract. Um, we're going to sign it, and I want you there. So as I go through it, if I have any questions, I can, I can ask you about it. And I said, sure, no problem. He said, well, yeah, there is a problem. And the problem is the time difference. Um, I'll be phoning you at 530 in the morning. I said, no problem. He said, are you sure? And I said, yeah, no problem. Well, try that with a downtown lawyer. Um, you will pay, you know, triple the normal rate if he has to, or she has to get up and go in um, that early in the morning or has to take the call from her home or his home. And, um, <clears throat> but for me, it was, it was just no problem at all. At 5.15, uh, my office manager and I get up because that's my wife. And we walk downstairs, we get our coffee, we go out on our back uh, patio um, and we get in the hot tub and we sit there drinking coffee, watching the sun come up. And um, then the phone rang and she went, um, Peter Olin's office, um, I'll see if he's in. Um, and I turned off the jet so it didn't go in the background. Um, and she said, I'll see if he's in. And she said, are you in? I said, I'm in the hot tub. She hands me the phone and I'm sipping coffee in my hot tub, watching the sun come up completing a contract on the phone with a client in Australia and billing for it. I mean, that is the way to do business. It really is. The drawback is if you have kids or other distractions, um, particularly kids, because they don't know that dad's in the office. Um, <clears throat> one time I was in my office and my wife was out um, and I was sitting at my desk and I had a window and I was looking out the window. I was talking to a client on the phone. All my uh, documents for my court case were uh, uh, set on a, a table behind me and I have a, a stamp that goes chukum, chukum, chukum. put your name and barrister and solicitor and address and phone number and everything on it so they can do that on the documents and you don't have to fill it out all the time um, and I'm sitting on the phone yeah, and, I was, and all of a sudden I hear chukum, 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 and I think Kathleen out me here <gasps> and I turn around and there's my uh, oldest daughter, who was about four at the time, <coughs> stamping all my documents. Unfortunately, not in <laughs> right places, but she seen me do it, and she just came walking into the room and uh, started doing it herself. Another time, I was with a client, and uh, she walked through the room waving a piece of paper saying, Dad, I have my affidavit. And she was really young, and, and I thought, oh. You know. And the client just looked down, and he said, um, wow, I have a hard time with that word. <clears throat> so, um, but other than those drawbacks, um, having my law practice in my home has has been really wonderful. You can also charge off a portion of the expenses for your mortgage and, um, and other things to the business because part of your home is being used as an office. Okay, so that's my uh, education, my work experience, <clears throat> um, and uh, my teaching. I have taught uh, Bedham 107, I still do, of course, uh, and I'm teaching law too, obviously. And I teach a course called uh, International Trade and Law, um, which is a really interesting course. We run it like a business. So if you uh, haven't had enough of me after this, you can uh, sign up for that one. It's only taught in the fall. So. Um, I've taught uh, uh, Management 101, and I have taught uh, BATM 268, the entrepreneurship course. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, uh, oh, and I've also taught the MBA faculty at UBC, and the university sent me to 
Vietnam to teach at the Open University down there when we had an association with them. That was really interesting. The um, uh, I'd walk into the room and there'd, it'd be long and narrow and there'd be like 300 people there and they'd all stand up. And they would not sit down until I told them to. Okay, so I learned to say, uh, Moi noi sin chow, or sin chow moi noi, which means hello, sit down. <clears throat> and uh, they'd all applaud <laughs> and they'd sit down. They knew English, so I did not have to use an interpreter. Um, and that was really an interesting experience. It really gave me an international flavor. Um, all right, I think that's enough about me. Uh, getting back to the course, um, uh, I have the um, uh, grading profile, which looks like this, okay, um, and it's on eLearn, and it explains that there are uh, two exams, a three-hour midterm exam and a three-hour final exam. Uh, the final exam will be non-cumulative to the greatest extent possible. I say the greatest extent possible because there are some things that are common to all the lectures that can be on both the midterm and the final. But for the most part, um, they're, they're two separate batches of material. Um, the, uh, let me grab the... So you have the midterm and the final. And then there's a drafting assignment with 10%. This is a very small um, uh, contract where I give you a precedent, a small scenario, and the idea is to get the signature lines correct after identifying the parties and uh, thinking about other things that you might want to put into the contract uh, along the lines of boilerplate so it, uh, it functions properly. Um, then there's a group project worth 30%. Uh, I have a series of topics and what I do is I give you a memo from Will Argue, with a name like that, you have to be a lawyer, right, uh, of a law firm and ask for a memo back on a specific legal topic. Um, and um, uh, the, and then you do a presentation for 10% on that project. Yeah, that works out. I was just checking my math. Um, and it used to be that when you did your presentation in class, I would give you immediate feedback, which is impossible this uh, with COVID-19. Uh, and, um, and then um, all the other students would do peer critiques, and then I would give you a written uh, summary of my suggested ways that you could improve, and they would give you your peer critiques, and, uh, and you would then... Um, uh, have that material and you would send me back a short memo saying three ways that you could improve. Um, I'm not sure how I'm going to work the peer critique things or if I'm even going to try because administratively it would be a nightmare because the peer critique should come in to me. I should collect them all, attach them to mine and send it to you, the presenters. Um, I'll work on that. Um, it may just be that you'll uh, receive my suggestions. Okay, midterm draft assignment project. Yeah, that's it. So that's in the um, uh, grading profile. Now, the I give you a memo. You have to give me a memo back. And um, uh, a couple of things about the memo. Um, memos, there's really two kinds. There's the ones that they always talk about when you take business writing. And that's the little short memo when it says, uh, you know, meeting at 4 o'clock and you fire it out so that everybody comes to the meeting. Um, and then there's more extensive memos, which are somewhere between uh, the short memo and a business report. Um, and what I'm looking for is a slightly longer memo. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't know how long it should be. Okay, that's the easy answer. I don't want anyone to come into my office and say, or contact me on email and say, uh, uh, Mr. Holden, um, uh, how long should it be? And should it be double spaced or triple spaced? Because um, if you ever say that to your boss, you'll probably be filling out an application form in the unemployment line. Um, I, I had last year someone who put the margins in and then with the heading of the memo and everything and triple space, they managed to give me a memo that was a little over a page long and thought, Phew, 
that's the easier 30% I ever got. Well, believe me, they didn't get 30%. Um, you have something the boss wants you to answer. So you start writing, and when you're finished giving him or her the answer that they're looking for, you stop. How long should that be? It should be three pages, four pages, five pages, six pages, seven pages. I don't know. Okay, it's as simple as that. So, um, and the other thing is I don't want simple downloads. Um, in my international business law class, um, I run it like a business. And so I wanted a team to go out and find out what, if anything, the EDC does to, uh, that could help us. <clears throat> Did I want an uh, explanation of the EDC? The Export Development Corporation was formed in 1962 under auspices of the House of Commons and then subsequently became in charge of this, that, and the other thing. No, it's the last thing your boss wants is to spend time on that. What the boss wants to know is, is there an office in Vancouver? Can you deal with them on the phone? Do you have to go in in person? Are they user-friendly? How much does the service cost? Um, and, and then also, you know, what services do they have? Um, and the EDC had, has something like five different things they do. Two were applicable to our operation. Well, I got this long memo explaining not only those two, but the other three. Okay. What you do is you say, there's these three, but they really don't apply to our operation, so I'm going to concentrate on these two. And then you've cut down on what you have to give the boss, but don't give me stuff right off the internet. Um, if I wanted stuff off the internet, I would uh, sit up with a glass of milk and uh, uh, a cup of coffee, or a glass of milk and peanut butter and sandwich and do it myself. Um, just turning out to the lecture schedule, which looks like that, which is also uh, attached to eLearn. Um, it gives you the week and the material that we're going to cover. So you can see that a large portion is review. And the reason for that is that we found over the years that a lot of the material that uh, you took in Batman 107, when you were finished, you forgot. Okay. And so um, Batman 307 is an opportunity to um, refresh your memory on that and then cover new material. So we go over the Canadian legal system, uh, the legal systems of the world, torts, contracts, corporations, pro proprietorships, partnerships, uh, intellectual property. And then we get into unjust enrichment, discharge of contracts, and legal devices for securing credit. Um, they're on videos, of course. So I'm going to put a list of the links for the videos um, on eLearn. And what you look and you think, okay, in a week... Uh, one, I have to have the introductory lecture. Okay, I've done that. Uh, then I have to get into risk management in Canadian business. Um, okay, uh, okay, that's uh, chapter two. And uh, so what I have to do is I have to go to the chapter two video, uh, you know, and then the next one, uh, oh, and three, you know, and so <clears throat> you, can, you can do it that way. Now, the um, risky business is really easy to read. It was designed to make it easy for um, the first year students so you can very quickly uh, listen to the video, read the material uh, for at least um, chapters 1, 2, 3, 7, and 8. There are questions at the end of the chapter which if you want to do and send them to me, um, I will not answer them or correct them. What I will do though is send you my answers and my corrections and then you can check your answers and if you have any problems, email me. Okay, if you don't want to do them, that's your decision. Um, the uh, uh, the book has is, is got a really good index and uh, list of cases and uh, statutes, so it's fairly usable. Um, okay, <clears throat> one thing about the intellectual property, um, I have done an intellectual property video for Bad M107. Surprise, 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 the material is the same for 307. And surprise, 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 the material is the same for uh, uh, IBUS 340, International Trade and Law. So I'm not going to do another video, okay? So I did one a couple of years ago for a makeup class for the BEDM 107 section 76, which was a mixed mode. Um, so I had to deliver one lecture in class and then one lecture online. So this is the online version. So when it starts off and it says Batman 107, 
<coughs> section 76. Um, ignore that, but the material is the same. Um, on November, in the week of November the 2nd to 6th, there will be a midterm examination covering chapters 1, 2, 3, 7, and 8, <coughs> and a selected portion of 9, as well as the new material. So, um, consult the lecture schedule before contacting me and saying, uh, Peter, what's on the uh, midterm exam, please? Um, that'll be the first time you've asked that question. Um, but it'll be the 478th time I've answered it. And so I get a little cranky. Okay. Um, what I hope you'll do is look at that and say, oh, okay, ah, but I have a question about unjust enrichment. And then contact me about unjust enrichment, but don't, don't uh, contact your instructor without reading the materials first. So there's um, uh, all the projects are due on uh, October the 23rd. Uh, the midterm is on the, the, f um, uh, the week of November the 2nd. Uh, your contract assignments are due the week following that. And then the final exam, we do a review on December 7th. That being said, the only other thing that we do in this course, um, and I still have to do the videos for those, is I have some practice problems, which were in this material that I used to sell at the bookstore to sell, rather. Um, I will post um, a introductory uh, chapter problem about the Canadian legal system. It's a review. And um, I will post a tort problem. And I will put on a um, corporation problem. And it's really a good idea if you, when I post those, you actually do them after watching the videos and then look at my video when I review it. Because it's like, um, question, always answers this. Question, always answers this. You don't learn, okay? But if you question and then you try to answer it and you look in the book, um, then you go, oh, okay, oh, I can see how, yeah, that was a pretty good answer. Well, that one wasn't so good. And then you're learning more and being prepared for the open book exam. One of the risks of the course is I don't need the textbook. You know, I'll just open up the exam page and I'll Google it. You know, I mean, what could go wrong? Um, I had uh, an IBUS course, or, or pardon me, a, a course in the NABU program, and I had a question. And, and everybody thought, oh, phew, we can Google that. And it was about a signature line on a contract where somebody... Um, put their th uh, thumbprint in red beside their name. And the question was, uh, you know, was that a seal? Could that be considered to have sealed the document? Google that. Documents, seal. What could go wrong? I got all these answers about the FBI files and how they are sealed with all the documents inside them. You know how much you get for that? Zero. So um, you have to be really, really careful. Um, and as I go through the lecture guide, what I'll do is I'll point out potential exam questions to sort of help prepare you for that. So, and then before the um, midterm exam, I will give you last terms, uh, last year's midterm exam, and you can uh, go through that, try it, and then come to class. Uh, come to class, duh. Uh, then you can uh, look at my video on that, and you can... Um, Answer, uh, answer those ahead of time, you'll do better on the exam. Same thing with the final. Um, all right, the last thing I want to talk about is um, how to pass the course. And I found with BATM 107, uh, brand new students, um, they would tend to let things slide. Um, I don't ask for you to do the problems and hand them in with your name so I can check. Um, so I'm, I'm not like your mother or your teacher in high school. And so the knee-jerk reaction is, oh, if I don't have to do it, why bother? Um, and then someone would come in at the uh, after the, the term was over and say, oh, Mr. Holden, I only got 43 out of 100 on the, on, the, on the in the course. Can you give me some extra work to bring me up to 50 because I really need to pass? And my answer to that is no. Um, two reasons. Number one is... Um, I have to be certain that you have at least a basic understanding of the material before I can let you pass it because we don't want to get 
some graduate out there who has absolutely no idea about um, material that they should have learned. And the other is, it wouldn't be fair to the other students, the ones that got uh, 56, so can I do a little bit of extra work and get a C minus? Uh, you know, I really need a C plus, so I only had a C minus, can I do a little bit of extra work to get a C plus? Um, and then there's the person that got, you know, A minus, and they're, oh, three marks away from an A. Can I do a little something to get an A plus? Or, pardon me, so I don't do that, because it wouldn't be fair. I'd have to do it for everyone, and then at some point, you know, why don't I just give A pluses to everybody? And of course, you're sitting there saying, yeah, why not? <clears throat> anyway, um, uh, so I don't do that. So what I do is I give them... Uh, I was upset at the number of people that would uh, do that, so I gave them a uh, three-page uh, uh, memo on eLearn, and it says how to pass this course. And I'm, I'm going to apologize right now because you are second and third year students, and now I've... I don't know why I did it. Hold on one sec. Oh, yeah. Um, I can't find it. I'm going to put you on hold for one sec. All right, I found my sheet. Um, it looks like this. I'm going to post it to eLearn. And the first thing I'd like to do is apologize to any one of you who thinks this is a bit condescending. Um, <clears throat> and I do that because it's for my first year students. Um, but some of the things I say in here can be helpful to you as well. Um, so um, ignore, ignore the parts that you find irritating. Um, but when I did this, I said, okay, the first thing you do is you have to attend classes. Um, you're tested on uh, not what's in the textbook, but what I cover in my lectures and uh, things that I write on the imaginary whiteboard here and um, uh, articles that I specifically ask you to read, all right? Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's not quite as critical for an online course because you will undoubtedly look at the videos but the other thing about the videos is you have to take notes um, it, it's like going to a lecture and listening to somebody and thinking wow that's a really good idea well I really like that and then walk into the lecture and you go now what again was it um, <clears throat> the, I, I teach them a lecture guide slides uh, and uh, you're all familiar with those um, but you can't put everything on the slide that you want to and so there's going to be some terms that need some further um, inform, uh, explanation and uh, definition so take notes. Cell phones and computers. Um, my, my youngest daughter can be doing an English essay and have uh, a movie going at the same time. I don't know how, but um, she seems to be getting really good marks anyway. So um, I would, I just caution you against having too many other things going on at the same time because it's going to interrupt. In class, I used to... Uh, <laughs> Had a bit of reputation as a computer uh, slammer. Um, somebody would be, you know, with their computer in the class, sitting at the back, going, you know, playing the, ne the next NFL game. Uh, and um, I lecture and I walk around. I walk right beside them, and uh, and they would, you know, you know, and I'd go, and I'd slam their computer closed and tell them to get out of class. Um, I, have, I should be careful, I guess. If I slam their fingers in the computer, I'll be up on charges. Uh, but anyway, um, irrelevant now, but uh, just keep it in the back of your mind. Um, I think it would be a good idea to buy the textbook. And uh, if you buy the textbook, it's a really good idea to read it. Okay. Um, read it either before class or after class. Um, but uh, it, having a textbook, not having a textbook, is like being a contractor to go out and build a house with a hammer or like... A, hockey player that's going to play hockey but you know doesn't need a hockey stick um, you uh, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage um, there are end of chapters questions for the first chapters which you can do and uh, you can either do you can look at them and if you can answer them in your mind you go okay that's fine I got that and then you get to one you don't know the answer to it then try to answer it and send that one to me and um, I'll respond by giving you my answers as I mentioned, we do practice problems. Do them beforehand, uh, and you'll do better. Um, index cards is how I got through law school. Uh, <laughs> technology has 
has gone a long way. But when I was in, in law school, I would get index cards and I write the name of a case on one side and the ratio decedendi on the other. I would write the name of a section on one, of a statute on one side and then pardon me, the definition on the other, the ones that I really had to know. And I would carry them around um, and I would practice them. One year I had a young lady come into my office, sit down, and she was just about crying because she'd done so poorly on the midterm exam. And she said, and I did the index cards, and she put them on my desk. And I went, oh my gosh, how could she do the index cards and do so poorly? And so I said, well, you know, did you have an opportunity to practice them? And she sort of went, and I said, when did you do them? And she said, when I, would, you know, the two days before I was studying for the exam. Well, you know, doing those index cards two days before the exam is going to help. But what got me through law school was the fact that I did those index cards and practiced them every time I had free time. Um, Ottawa, very cold. You know, you get up in the morning and I didn't have a car, so I'd go out and stand and wait for the bus. Well, I could stand and wait for the bus and just shiver, or I could go through the index cards and shiver. Um, uh, Friday at about 2.30, I was finished my classes. My wife's in Montreal. I'd go down and I'd get on the train from, from Ottawa to Montreal and I'd go out to spend quality time with her. And um, I could sit in the bar car and drink beer, but I didn't drink at that time. So uh, <clears throat> something that I've corrected now. Just kidding. Anyway, I, I'd sit in the bar car and I'd go to Montreal and I could watch the scenery. <laughs> Or I could sit there and go through my index cards. Okay. And um, then I'd get down to Montreal and I'd go and see my wife and she'd want to spend quality time, which for her meant let's go shopping. Uh, not my favorite thing. A lot of guys don't like it. Um, but I, I went and we'd go down and we'd find a shop and we'd go in and, and the clerk would say, can I help you? And I'd say, yes, do you have a chair? And she'd go right there and I'd sit down, thank you. And I'd go through my index cards. My wife would come out and she'd have a dress on. She'd say, what do you think? And I'd go, oh, that is you. That is really nice. That's fantastic. And and then she'd try on another one and she'd come out and I'd go, oh, no, I don't think it does anything for you. Not that I really knew, okay, but I had to pretend I was interested. Just kidding. I tried my best. Anyway, <clears throat> um, any chance I had, I would do those cards. And, you know, I always had them in my pockets. People probably thought I was 180, 190 pounds. Um, and nowadays, though, you have an advantage. There's such a thing as Quizlet, which, you know, I mean, everybody goes around with their phones. It's like, <clears throat> you know, it's like almost a part of you. And, um, uh, and, and you know, you, you have to impress everybody about, you know, what, 28 likes. Um, <laughs> sorry. But anyway, um, you can now do the index cards on your phone. It's called Quizlet. <clears throat> so you can be sitting there <clears throat> in the park. Everybody goes, wow, look at that person. You know, oh, they must be popular. Look at them texting. And you're not, you're studying, but you look like you are. Um, so it's fantastic. Uh, <clears throat> I'm being facetious, but Quizlet is there to use. On that sheet, I even put in the uh, link for Quizlet. I talked about doing the practice exams. Um, ask questions. Um, there's ask questions and then coaching hours on the sheet. You'll obviously ask questions in coaching hours now by email rather than in class. Um, but do it. Um, I had one person ask me three questions. And, the th and the, when he got to the third question, he said, I'm really sorry, Mr. Holden. <laughs> you know, like... Why? I mean, that's why we're here, right? So ask questions. And then the uh, two footnotes on the above um, really don't apply to you. Um, one is that uh, if you miss a class, please don't come to my uh, you know, email and say, um, uh, well, okay, you can't miss classes, so let's forget that one. Uh, and then the second one is about coming in when you've uh, just failed the course and trying to get a few extra marks to get through. Again, it doesn't really bother or apply to you. All right. Um, with the exception of one other thing I want to say, that's it. The other thing is um, the first part of the course, all the review, you have the textbook. Um, then we get into some new material. Um, unjust enrichment is uh, uh, and uh, um, conscien conscien conscienability are covered in the textbook. But um, discharge of contracts isn't. 
Um, I will post online a chapter from another textbook, which we are allowed to do. This is not copyright infringement. And, um, uh, and you'll be able to uh, read that. Uh, for the next part, when we go through uh, property law, um, what else do we do? We do international uh, business and one other one that I can't think of right now. Um, those, those new things, um, you can actually, um, just let me grab it and look at it. Um, we cover um, uh, real property law, landlord and tenant, um, uh, international business transactions, and mortgages. Um, I think my lectures and the lecture guide will be sufficient for that. If you need some additional reading, please contact me and I will arrange to get you some additional material. Whew. Okay, that finishes the first lecture. Um, I apologize for the bobbing head, um, but uh, we'll get through this and um, uh, look forward to dealing with you online. Thank you very much.